All right, we are going to talk about sustainability and introduce this concept, which is going to be so important to the rest of the AP Environmental Science course. Um, I don't know how it adds to sustainability to make that dog look like a Chia pet, but I found this very amusing. All right, so what is sustainability? It's basically us as humans being able to use resources to support ourselves, our lifestyle, and our society without depleting those resources to the point that they're not available to future generations. So there are some basic requirements. One, any damage that's done to environmental systems must not damage them beyond their ability to recover. Renewable re resources cannot be depleted faster than they regenerate. So going with our forestry that we've been talking about, don't cut down trees faster than they can be replanted and grown. Uh, and then non-renewable resources must be used sparingly. And if you're not sure what would count as a renewable versus a non-renewable resource, don't worry, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So there are some environmental indicators that we can use to help figure out whether we are moving towards sustainability or not. A big one is biodiversity. Um, and so we've talked about ecosystem services before. We've talked about what ecosystems do for us as humans. And um, they're, they need to have higher biodiversity in order to function and provide ecosystem services. So this diagram right here is from a study where they were trying to see how much the biodiversity of various ecosystems has been compromised. Um, anything that's colored in blue or green has not been damaged to the point where it won't be able to sustain us. Anything in yellow, black, or red has been damaged to the point that it um, kind of compromises or risks our ability to sustain future generations without human intervention to try and kind of fix some of the things that we've messed up. Um, one of these examples of animal pollination of food crops, we get billions of dollars worth of free pollination services from various animals. These can be insects, these can be other animals, uh, bees, and not just the kind of bees that you're used to seeing like honeybees, but there are lots of species of wild bees that also pollinate food crops for us. However, they are, you know, if you've heard of colony collapse disorder, um, there's a lot of risk of loss of these bee species, which could compromise our ability to get our food pollinated, which could lead to food shortages. Speaking of which, food production is a very important use of land. So if you look at this diagram, what you'll see is that the Earth's surface of it, about 71% of it is ocean, about 29% of it is land. Of the land surface, 71% of it is habitable, meaning we can do stuff on it, live on it. Because um, there's glaciers and there's also barren land like deserts and things that we can't really live on. Of the habitable land on the planet, we use 46% of it for agriculture. That's almost half of the world's land. Then we've got about 38% as forest, 14% as shrubland, 1% uh, as freshwater, 1% as urban land. 77% of the land that we are using for agriculture is not used to directly feed humans. Instead, it's being used to feed livestock. Um, livestock doesn't provide a very large chunk of our calorie intake. So we're using a giant amount of land to support the caloric needs of very little people, very few people. Even when we're looking at protein, which you see here on the bottom, which most people associate like meat eating with, um, only 37% of it comes from meat and dairy. About 63% of it comes from plant-based food. So this is why, um, as a part of sustainability, there's a big movement to create these meat replacement products, things like uh, Beyond Meat or Impossible. Um, nobody's saying people have to give up eating meat altogether, but either reduce the uh, reduce eating meat or um, use some of these plant alternatives instead, which would allow us to use less land for agriculture, l requiring us to clear less land. And then um, that would be more sustainable. Um, in, in fact, we could even let some of the land perhaps go back to more natural ecosystems if we weren't using as much for agriculture. Um, however, that's not to say it's all bad news. Um, the Green Revolution, which we've started to talk about in class, and um, 
various other things that we'll talk about when we continue talking about agriculture have improved the production of food, things like farming techniques, breeding plants to produce hardier varieties or breeding animals to produce more productive varieties. I believe there is a type of cattle that looks super uber muscled like it's on steroids that was bred to try and produce as much meat as possible. Um, of course, climate change is going to be the biggest issue of y'all's lifetimes if it isn't already. I mean, it is. Um, so the average global surface temperature has been rising on the top uh, left diagram right here. You see the temperature change from 1901 to 2002. Um, anything where you see this negative 0.2, there are these tiny areas, including us, where there may have been a, a negative temperature change on average, but you see some areas like the central part of Canada where there is a four degree increase on average of temperature. Um, and so not all areas of the planet will be equally affected by climate change. Um, there will be some areas that are going to experience dramatic warming and that's going to have massive consequences that we'll talk about more in unit nine. But one of the big things that happens is that you're going to have a change in um, in climate patterns. So you might have more extreme weather, et cetera. And so that is going to have a really big impact. Some areas will get droughts, like California has been in a very long-term drought. Others will get flooding. Um, and then unfortunately, what's gonna happen is you see these areas right here that are in red. Those are areas that are vulnerable to biome changes. Um, what's generally going to happen is biomes will tend to shift either upwards in latitude or altitude. They'll, they'll move. I mean, the climates will get warmer. So eventually those plants um, and ecosystems may start creeping northward. Um, the problem is, is that uh, pest species have these specific ranges they can live in, or sometimes they get killed off by hard freezes. And if the temperatures aren't reaching as low, uh, uh, like temperature in the winter, then these species populations can grow out of control. So there's a couple of like beetle species and things that are eating trees in various forests in North America. And it's thought that part of the reason why they're becoming such a huge pest problem is because they haven't had a cold enough temperatures to reduce their population. Diseases um, that are carried by certain of these insect vectors can also spread. So malaria, which is carried by mosquitoes, could have uh, West Nile virus as well, um, could have expanded ranges because mosquitoes would be able to live in more uh, climates than before. Um, and then unfortunately, what you see on the right hand side, these are the, this is the distribution of biomes from 1961 to 1990. This is the projected distribution of biomes from 2071 to 2100. Notice that the most dramatically affected areas are these northern latitudes. You're going to see probably a lot of taiga being um, kind of replaced with other forests. You're going to see tundra disappearing. You're going to see melting of permafrost and obviously melting of glaciers, all of which have negative consequences. Um, organisms, people have pointed out when they're criticizing, critiquing, you know, all the emphasis on climate change, oh, organisms can adapt. But the thing is, organisms adapt on the time scale of thousands or millions of years. Climate change is happening on the scale of hundreds of years. It's too rapidly for organisms to adapt. Another thing, I talk about biomes shifting, but if you think about it, what has to shift for the biomes to shift is the plants. If you have these long-lived plant species like trees, um, it's going to take them a long time to shift their their territory northwards because they don't get up and move. Instead, their seedlings will probably be more um, more uh, prosperous and more likely to, to grow into trees in the northern parts of their range. But if climate change changes the, the temperatures or the weather conditions too drastically, they may die off before their seedlings can replenish the population. So this becomes a, a very big issue, especially, like I said, in your lifetimes, because hopefully by 2100, I will not be alive because I would be like 118, and I do not think I would be enjoying that. Climate change is also going to impact agriculture. Um, any of the changes that happen, like for example, what's listed here, you can have excessive heat um, when the temperatures increase or hotter summers, like 
we've been experiencing hotter summers. Europe has especially been experiencing hotter summers. Um, that can decrease surface water. Um, then drought, which causes crop failure. In areas where you have excessive precipitation, so flooding, that can damage crops as well and remove topsoil. And then you've got new pests that can move into an area because they're now able to survive in the changing climate. The human population also is going to have a huge impact on sustainability. Um, we talked very briefly about the fact that we're not 100% sure what the carrying capacity of humans is. Some scientists believe we've exceeded it. Some people believe that with technology and so on, uh, we should be able to support maybe like 10, 12 billion people on the planet. It just kind of depends on what data you're looking at. However, as you increase the population of humans, keep in mind, each individual person has an ecological footprint. So that's like the ecological footprint of one person. Okay, no big deal. Before we had a billion people on the planet, okay, that was the ecological footprint. But as the population has kept growing and growing and growing, we now are, you know, adding a billion people to uh, the world's population in a very short period of time. And that is straining resources. So if our population exceeds the carrying capacity, which remember, we don't know with certainty, resources are gonna degrade. When those resources degrade, you have that dieback or that overshoot, and then you're gonna have a decrease in what kind of population the planet can sustain. All right, so I said we were going to talk about non-renewable and renewable resources and the difference between them. So renewable resources are defined as those that can be replenished at the rate at which they're used. If it's a resource we use very slowly, then it can be replenished very slowly. If it's a resource we use rapidly, then it's going to need to be replenished rapidly. Um, most resources that don't replenish within human lifetimes are not considered renewable. So what are some examples? Sunlight, water, wind, geothermal energy, um, biomass, so plants, etc. Those can be renewable. Non-renewable resources have a limited supply, and once they're gone, they're gone, or they're not going to renew on a time scale that's short enough for us to be able to really use. So some examples of um, resources that are not renewable because they, they don't renew on a, a time scale that's going to work for humans is fossil fuels. Um, there may be more fossil fuels being produced within the earth, although the kind of conditions of the creatures that you know, died and their remains became fossil fuels aren't the same as they are now, but it's not happening fast enough. It takes hundreds of millions of years for these things to form. So if we use them all up, they're gone. And then, you know, maybe whatever civilizations here in 300 million years might be able to use whatever fossil fuels develop in the meantime. Um, minerals, all these minerals that we dig for in the earth, iron, copper, aluminum, even things like uranium are going to be non-renewable. Um, they get exposed by geologic processes or by us digging, but in all honesty, there is a limited amount of copper on the planet. There is a limited amount of titanium on the planet. Um, and when we deplete what's very easily accessible at the surface, it becomes more and more expensive to find new sources. And so the prices of things that include, you know, iron or copper, et cetera, are going to skyrocket. Like there are lots of people who go around and steal copper from uh, various uh, electronic devices and sell it because copper is more expensive because it's harder to find now. So now that we've talked about resources, let's talk about resource depletion. So um, if you don't recycle re non-renewable resources or replace them with alternatives, then they can be depleted or used up. So if you'll look at the graph on the top, this is a graph I found that um, kind of has a prediction of the amount of iron ore that's left to be extracted. Notice that it's, you know, going to reach zero around 2080. Um, and this is the amount of iron that we're extracting uh, or that's been extracted. So uh, the more we extract, the less there is left behind. Uh, luckily, iron is something that is fairly easy to um, recycle. And also people have been working on finding alternatives like some carbon nanotube technology and so on uh, to try and replace steel and other things that we use iron for.
That's great. Um, we can also, though, use up renewable renewable resources faster they can, than they can be replenished. So this um, graph on the bottom is showing the annual change in forest area in 2015. Notice anything in the red, and this is some UN data, anything in the red has lost a large amount of forest area. So Brazil, um, some areas of Southeast Africa, and Southeast Asia. <coughs> into Indonesia, they have been losing a, a lot of forest area, so they're cutting down more than they're replanting or allowing to grow, um, and that can deplete that resource, so that way those that forest is not available to provide ecosystem services or any other resources that we get from it. Um, resource degradation is very closely related to resource depletion. You are using up some of the resources, they're not disappearing, um, but their quality is going to be decreased. And so they're not going to be as useful to us, or they're not going to be able to support as many individuals. Uh, one way that we can try to make sure that we reach sustainability is by only taking a sustainable yield. So that's the amount of a renewable resource that you can take without reducing how much there is left behind. So here we have an example of catching fish. Uh, if the fish population sustains at a certain amount, like for example, they reproduce this many every year, um, there's a certain amount that is the optimal yield. And that is you take just enough so that way the amount that are left can reproduce and replenish the population without it decreasing. When you go over that, which is something we have traditionally done historically, then you take out more than can be replenished and you start decreasing the quality of the, the fish supply. Now this, um, this applies to any resource, not just fish. So trees, uh, you know, um, bamboo, if you were going to make bamboo toilet paper, like what I talked about in class. So theoretically, if you can just harvest things at the maximum sustainable yield, you should be able to use it indefinitely or long term without worry about depleting the resource. However, this is really hard to do because the natural ecosystems are very complicated. They're complex. And while scientists try to build these super complicated models to, um, mimic what's going on and predict what will happen, there are always some variables that we miss. Uh, there's only so complicated a model we can build at this point. And so it's hard to make accurate predictions about what the maximum sustainable yield will be. Also, maximum sustainable yield could change. Uh, what if there is a year where um, there's, like for fish, reduced upwelling, which means less nutrients, which means lower population. That year, the maximum sustainable yield might need to change. But if we don't measure the nutrient levels, how would we know that we need to change the maximum sustainable yield? So there's there's some issues with this, but you know there, there are issues that can be worked out. So that is it for sustainability. Next, we'll go into all the various topics of land use, how we've done it in the past, whether or not that is sustainable, and better ways to do it in the future.